Doflamingo had a plan. That plan was to collapse the entire world government, bring down the four emperors, spank the revolutionary army on their insolent behinds, and ascend to become a literal immortal god king of the planet, sitting atop the empty throne. And he would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for those meddling kids. But what if there were no meddling kids? What if Doflamingo's plan had been allowed to succeed? What would the world look like? Well, the answer to that question is more horrific than you could ever imagine. Or not, maybe you have like a, a really sick imagination. Whatever, let's find out. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam and the most horrific thing that I can imagine is mushrooms on toast. I mean, ugh, why would you ruin toast like that? But today we are here to talk about the Machiavellian misanthropic and on occasion medescent mess of a man that is Don Quixote do Flamingo. Medescent means damp or slightly moist, by the way. And this moist man was at one time the biggest threat in all of One Piece. And when I say threat, I know that's a very subjective word because it all depends on one's perspective and what faction they represent. Not with do Flamingo though. When I call him a threat, I mean it doesn't matter where in this world you stand, this flamboyant flagrant is a threat to you. Emperor, elder stars, elderly whoop slap. It doesn't matter which of these best describes you personally because do Flamingo is still going to be gunning for your head. And he may even wear your bucket hat afterwards for fun. And here's why he would have succeeded. Before we continue though, our subscribers of the day are Arya Lynch, Ivan Alviles, and Croc Watch, who all did an amazing thing, which was press the subscribe button for the Grand Line Review, which by the way, doing so will result in consistent injections of One Piece culture administered directly into your YouTube feed. So if you'd like to be our next subscriber of the day, then hit the button and please do say hi in the comments below if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet. Welcome. But to begin with Doflamingo, I think that his existence really does get pushed to one side these days. Mainly because he isn't the best puncher nor his crew particularly amazing at the punching either. He's powerful enough, but he doesn't have the physicality or the following to take this world by force. So instead, Doflamingo focused his efforts through a different avenue. Well, avenue is plural actually, because Doflamingo achieved something that no other character in the series has ever even come close to, which is global domination via trade and politics. And I get it, those are two highly unarousing words, but just consider it this way. Doflamingo formed a business partnership with Kaido. This was a deal to provide Mr. Man Beast with smile fruits to amp up the Emperor's crew and allow him to build the forces necessary to wage war against, checks, notes, literally everything. Because if there's one thing that every military superpower needs, it is alpaca heads, lion crotches, and of course, chicken butts. However, through this trade deal, Doflamingo earned the backing of the strongest creature in the world and his emperatic forces. And immediately that meant that Doflamingo had effective immunity from the other three emperors because any action taken against Doflamingo would be tantamount to declaring war on Kaido. So the top players in the piracy world couldn't touch him, but it also safeguarded Doflamingo from the lower levels of piracy. As with the backing of an emperor, it meant that smaller pirate groups were much less inclined to make Doflamingo their enemy as that would be like poking the vicious yet delicious Kaido beehive. But Doflamingo doesn't just harvest his honey from a single hive. No, he, this is, this is a bad metaphor. Doflamingo does not keep all of his dragon eggs in the one Kaido basket because even an emperor of the sea cannot offer full protection, particularly against the world government. And this is where sneaky flamingo based politics come into play. Doflamingo due to his circumstances as a former celestial bungle nut holds very particular knowledge that if made public could destabilize the world government overnight. And the most prominent example of that we have is Doflamingo threatening to reveal what their national treasure is. However, realistically, he could probably cause a lot more damage than that. So in turn, Doflamingo blackmails not only the world government, but the five elder stars directly, and potentially even Eam himself actually, because in the end, Eam is the funky spiral-eyed dude guy who makes all of the decisions and stuff. Whatever the case though, through this blackmail, Doflamingo protected himself both against the world government and the Marines. And not only that, but he can also utilize those powers to his advantage, as on at least one occasion, he did display the power to utilize CP0 for his own personal needs. And I mean, if Doflamingo really wanted to, he could probably even order CP0 to dress up in French maid outfits and clean his various toilets. That is the kind of wild power that Doflamingo has, but it doesn't stop there. But he also demanded to become a warlord of the sea, which is yet another barrier of protection. The big thing here being that it froze his bounty. So there is absolutely no incentive whatsoever to go after Doflamingo. You'd be declaring war on an emperor, the world government, and even if you were successful, there's no reward for bringing Doflamingo Flamingo down, other than saying, I did the thing. So bounty hunters and other third parties are just like, eh, Doflamingo, that's, that's a 
lot of effing around for not a lot of finding out. Which only leaves us with underworld factions, groups that exist outside of the established public constructs, and wouldn't you know it, Doflamingo made himself indispensable to them as well by crafting the alias of Joker and becoming the most powerful of all of the underworld brokers, specializing in weapons, slavery, and even super rare goods. Things like Adam Wood or Dance Powder, stuff that you can't buy in your local pirate department store, but stuff that you can buy at your shady underground Mingo Mart. Stuff like perhaps the sponsor of today's video, Manscaped.com. And Manscaped are great because they have the tools to deal with the three major odor zones, being the body, the butt, and the balls. I mean, I'm pretty sure that your balls and your butt are the part of your body, but we'll, we'll just let that one slide. In any case, they've just launched their new lawnmower 4.0 waterproof electric trimmer, but also more things. Because this is the ultimate Manscaped experience, the performance package 4.0, and legitimately my balls cannot wait for the sheer glory ahead. This is my favorite part though, because once you're done doing the things with the things, you get to apply your, your crop preserver ball deodorant. Did you know that your balls need deodorant? I bet not. I bet you've just been living like some sort of filthy peasant. And if that's not quite enough, we also have the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. With soothing aloe vera and anti-inflammatory gel. Ah, oh, so soothing. But weirdly enough, not everything is about balls and also included in this package is the brand new Weed Whacker for trimming ear and nose hair. Go to manscaped.com today and save 20% off plus free international shipping when you use promo code GRANDLINE at checkout. Once again, trust me, your balls and your body will thank you. But now, back to malicious flamingos. With all of this in mind, Doflamingo became too big to fail because every major faction in this world had a vested interest in keeping Doflamingo in power. If Doflamingo were to just one day vanish, then Kaido would lose his source of weapons, the world government would lose his silence in regards to their many secrets, and the entire underworld would lose their greatest supplier. Doflamingo, despite not being the most powerful in a traditional sense of military might, lubed himself up and inserted himself into the global machine, becoming a truly indispensable cock. And if he were to stop spinning, then the entire machine would go, hey, what are you doing? If you don't spin, I don't spin. And the entire machine would just implode on itself. In a way, he was actually more dangerous than an emperor. Because from a world government perspective, sure, Kaido is a big guy who hits things. Hits things, like, really hard. But Doflamingo is a man who could have turned the world upside down by simply uttering a single sentence in public. And I really don't think this war of information side of Doflamingo is ever truly appreciated. Nobody will ever again accomplish what he was able to do, and he always had a keen mind for the metagame. You wanna know why we never saw Doflamingo's eyes? Because they're not actually there. Doflamingo's eyes were far, far too busy living in the future. In fact, one of his earliest quotes quotes from chapter 303 is, those without power had better run away while they can. Like an unstoppable wave, a new age of unmatched power is coming. Which in retrospect was actually Doflamingo referring to Kaido's plan of declaring war on the world, a situation that he was going to well and truly take advantage of. Which brings us to his ultimate plan. Knowing that he could neither oppose the world government or any of the emperors, Doflamingo's best option was to do the classic thing of just smacking the game off the table and then starting a new game. And Kaido's war was going to function as that great refresher, something that could bring down the world government as well as drag the other emperors into conflict with one another. It would have been a brutal, destructive, and incredibly lengthy conflict, but Doflamingo was looking even beyond that. Because the problem is, no matter who won this conflict, Doflamingo still likely would not have been able to oppose them. Because for example, Big Dragon Fist is always going to trump the limited powers of a tiny Flamingo Fist. So this is where fictional fruit comes into things. From quite early on in his career as a douchebag, Doflamingo had his sight set on the Ope Ope no Mi. At one stage, his plan was to have Rosinante eat the fruit and perform the immortality operation on him, which is also known as the Perpetual Youth Surgery or Perennial Youth Operation, depending on what you read and or watch. But this fruit was the key to the long game, because Doflamingo, as established, was always looking into the future. He had something that really no other high-level character in the series has, which is patience. And without the fear of growing old, Doflamingo would have been free to continue to be a master manipulator on into eternity and just gradually work his way to the top. I mean, think about it. If worse comes to worse, Doflamingo could defeat Kaido by simply outliving him. That's not quite it though, because the fruit was only half of the equation. Because according to Doflamingo, when the eternal youth granted by the Ope Openumi is combined with the ever mysterious national treasure, then that results in the very vaguely defined ability to quote, seize true world power. We have no real reason to doubt this either. If his plan had continued, Doflamingo would have been the only one with the knowledge and skill required to bring this combination to fruition. And at the very 
least in his mind brain, accomplishing this goal would give him the ability to deal with emperors, revolutionary armies, and I guess anything really. Thus ushering in a very dark yet bright pink era of the world, led by someone who sees every race as a commodity as opposed to a life form. Unfortunately, as brilliant as he is, Doflamingo was just looking so far ahead of himself that he lost sight of what was in front of him. And through a set of extraordinary coincidences, which in retrospect we label as fate, a coalition of rogue forces bred almost entirely by Doflamingo's own actions spawned to bring him down. It took a group of pirates who had no fear of the emperors, a marine admiral who had no fear of the world government, and a whole ton of other people who were just, who were just sort of there and mightily pissed off that they got turned into toys, because it's not a nice thing to do. Doflamingo believed that with the backing of an emperor, the underworld and the world government, that nobody could stand against him. However, Doflamingo made just enough small rogue enemies that his delicious pot of immortality soup boiled over and in the space of a single day, he lost everything. From riches to stitches, influence to insignificance, and most insultingly of all, pastel prominence to monochromatic mediocrity. However, even Doflamingo's defeat had major global ramifications, as he himself states to Suru when being transported to Impel Down. I was the one holding the reins, the reins on all the monsters in this world. You shouldn't have taken me down. Mark my words, this is going to kick off the greatest battle for power in the history of pirate kind. Which I don't know, POV, your Suru, this probably just sounds like crazy guys saying crazy things. But Doflamingo wasn't wrong. In fact, he was the opposite of wrong, which is right. Nobody was more essential to the current state of global stability than he was. Because let's examine the consequences of removing this cog from our world machine. Doflamingo's defeat directly triggered Kaido to put his war into action, because there was no point in waiting any longer. He had all the smile he would ever receive. Kaido just said, let's, let's go hit things now. And on the other side, Doflamingo's defeat directly triggered the dissolution of the Seven Warlords, which yes, was according to Fujitora's agenda, but without the support of King Riku at the Reverie and the widespread news of yet another corrupt warlord, this system would have remained in place. Furthermore, in a move that the world has yet to truly appreciate, Doflamingo's downfall also gave birth to the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. Because really, this fleet may as well be called the, the, the anti-stupid smile man alliance because Doflamingo cultivated it. He lured all of these individuals to one location and he is the core glue that bound them together. And this fleet is now destined to cause an instant of quote, historic proportions. And even putting the Grand Fleet to one side, Doflamingo's failure on Dress Rosa is what has allowed the Kozuki vassals to reunite and plan the raid on Onigashima, an event that is set to see two of the four emperors fall from prominence. So how wild is all of that? The mistakes of one singular string boy is going to be directly responsible for the defeat of two emperors, the rise of Luffy as a global superpower, and the dissolution of the entire warlord system. And that's before we even talk about the power vacuum that Joker's absence will have created in the underworld. And I really don't think that everything set in motion by removing this cog will truly be appreciated until we see the end game of One Piece. This domino effect is one of, if not the most severe we've ever seen. It's even an entire order of magnitude more chaotic than the death of Whitebeard. So maybe, just maybe, it was worth taking two and a half years to play out the events of a single day, because that single day changed the fate of the entire world. We were on a very dark path, destined for an eternal night featuring a long, unforgiving war, with Doflamingo gradually set to emerge as the ruler of a new cruel dystopia. But now, thanks to his removal, we're on the track to see the dawn of a much better world. Just like how you are on track to view this next video, it's also about One Piece, which is the thing that you like, because there's always more to learn, explore, and experience with this wonderful series, so I look forward to seeing you there.